Hello, it's Eric Strong from Strong Medicine. In today's episode of Intern Crash Course, I'm discussing sepsis. Let's start by answering, what is sepsis? According to our current understanding, sepsis is a life-threatening clinical syndrome caused by a dysregulated host response to infection, resulting in a characteristic constellation of physiologic and biochemical abnormalities. Sepsis has a spectrum of severity. In its mildest form, one can see some vital sign abnormalities such as fever, tachycardia, and tachypnea, along with leukocytosis. If more severe, the patient may develop hypotension responsive to infusions of IV fluids, along with organ dysfunction. Specific signs of organ dysfunction can include low urine output and increased creatinine, confusion or delirium, hypoxemic respiratory failure, liver failure and ileus, sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy and secondary heart failure, and a variety of hematologic derangements including thrombocytopenia, elevated INR, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and even leukopenia. If very severe, the patient will experience hypotension that is resistant to IV fluids on account of peripheral vasodilation, and they will have an elevation of serum lactate. This specific combination is what is currently required for a diagnosis of septic shock. And at some point, the physiologic and biochemical derangements become so severe as to be irreversible, at which point death is inevitable. Importantly, this is a spectrum. It's not meant to imply that patients necessarily pass through a smooth, linear progression from the left side to the right. There is a term that frequently comes up during discussions of sepsis, the Systemic Inflammatory Response Syndrome, or SIRS. The idea of SIRS was introduced in 1991 as a tool for clinicians to identify those patients who are at the highest risk of death from sepsis. SIRS was said to be present if at least two of the following were present. A temperature either greater than 38 or less than 36, a pulse above 90, a respiratory rate above 20 or PCO2 below 32, and either a white cell count above 12 or less than 4. There was then a relationship defined between sepsis, SIRS, and infection, in which a patient was said to have sepsis when they met both SIRS criteria and had clinical evidence of infection, such as positive cultures or a consolidation on chest X-ray. Layered on top of this Venn diagram, was another category of severe sepsis and severe SIRS, which is when either was associated with acute dysfunction of at least one organ system, such as acute kidney injury or respiratory failure. And then on top of this was the category of septic shock, which is when severe sepsis or severe SIRS was associated with hypotension refractory to fluids. Unfortunately, there were problems with this paradigm. Most significantly, the criteria for SIRS proved to be too inclusive. For example, if a patient with chronic leukemia, whose white blood cell count was always elevated, suddenly developed rapid atrial fibrillation, they would get classified as having the systemic inflammatory response syndrome and possibly put on a pathway to treat for sepsis, even though they had neither an infection nor even inflammation. Another problem was the sense that the categories of severe sepsis and severe SIRS ended up not being as clinically useful as clinicians expected they would be. As a consequence of these and other shortcomings, when an international consensus conference on sepsis called Sepsis 3 was held between 2014 and 2016 to come up with new definitions and new treatment guidelines, they decided to simplify the paradigm quite a bit. They got rid of the severe category, and they got rid of SIRS. So as of 2016, in the eyes of academic medicine, SIRS was no more. You'll still hear plenty of clinicians referring to SIRS on the wards, which is the primary reason I'm still talking about it, but professional societies and the medical literature has really tried to phase it out. So now, at this point, here is our simplified sepsis paradigm. A subset of patients with infection develop dysregulated host response leading to sepsis, and a subset of those patients have sepsis severe enough to lead to hypotension, refractory to fluids, and to an elevated lactate, 
in which case we say they have septic shock. This begs the question now, if SIRS and its associated criteria are no more, how do we identify a patient whose infection is severe enough to be labeled sepsis? Well, enter the SOFA score. SOFA standing for Sequential Organ Failure Assessment. The SOFA looks at six domains, oxygenation, coagulation, liver function, blood pressure, level of consciousness, and renal function. Each is scored based on severity of dysfunction between 0 and 4 points, leading to a maximum possible SOFA score of 24. Compared to the SIRS criteria, the SOFA score was thought to more accurately identify the patients at greatest risk of death. But as you can immediately appreciate, it's much more cumbersome. Because of this, a streamlined version of SOFA was also proposed called the Quick SOFA or QSOFA. The QSOFA has just three criteria, all of which can be assessed by physical exam alone. The patient gets one point if the respiratory rate is 22 or greater, one point if the systolic blood pressure is 100 or less, and one point for any degree of altered mentation. Sepsis is said to be likely if the patient has either two or three points. Unfortunately, despite initial enthusiasm for the QSOFA as an easy, and more accurate replacement for SIRS criteria, it's failed to catch on in many hospitals. I'm returning to the spectrum of severity to make one final point about the shifting definition of sepsis. Based on the currently recommended framework, labeling a patient as having sepsis requires them to have organ dysfunction. So this spectrum has, over time, narrowed a bit. Moving away from the definitions, how do you work up sepsis? You need to identify the cause and identify complications. To identify the cause, the first step is a thorough physical exam. Then two sets of blood cultures, a UA and urine culture, and other relevant cultures. For example, a sputum culture in a person with pneumonia and risk factors for unusual or multi-drug resistant pathogens, such as bronchiectasis or tracheostomy. Check a chest x-ray to look for pneumonia or a pleural effusion. If there's a possibility of intra-abdominal pathology, consider abdominal imaging, which could be either a CT scan or bedside ultrasound, depending on whether the patient is stable enough to go to the radiology department. What should be checked to identify complications? Well, a CBC will identify anemia and thrombocytopenia. A DIC panel consisting of the INR, PTT, and fibrinogen, along with a few other things, will identify DIC. A basic metabolic panel will help to identify AKI and an elevated anion gap acidosis. A serum lactate could help to identify systemic hypoperfusion. I'm going to address this question mark at the end of the video. LFTs will identify ischemic hepatitis, also known as a shock liver, and identify hyperbilirubinemia, which is a negative prognostic marker in sepsis. An ABG will allow you to quantify hypoxemia and calculate the P to F ratio, which is also a prognostic marker. The ABG will identify hypercapnia from ventilatory failure and will assess the pH. Among other things, extremes of pH are believed to contribute to vasopressor unresponsiveness. Although I had already mentioned a chest x-ray as a tool to help identify the cause of sepsis, it's also helpful to look for complications, specifically non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema from sepsis-triggered ARDS, as well as iatrogenic cardiogenic pulmonary edema from excessive volume repletion. A troponin will identify demand ischemia and a so-called type 2 MI. An ECG will also help with that and can look for arrhythmias, which may be rela related to the intrinsic stress of infection or related to catecholamine excess from pressors with beta agonist activity. And last, an echo will help to identify sepsis-induced cardiomyopathy or undiagnosed pre-existing heart failure that might complicate treatment. Now, when it comes to treatment, what are the priorities? First is, of course, ABCs, meaning ensure the patient has a pulse and respirations. But assuming that you don't need to immediately go down an ACLS pathway, the next priority is restoring hemodynamics. And there are two primary ways to do that.
The first is IV fluids given in rapid boluses, not via maintenance. I have an entire brief video series dedicated to IV fluids, but the profoundly oversimplified summary is that in almost all circumstances, you should be using crystalloid fluid rather than colloid. Balanced solutions such as lactate at ringers appear to be very slightly better than so-called normal saline. And a very general guideline on the infused volume is 30 milliliters per kilogram within the first three hours. But every patient is different and some will require much more than this. The other primary way to restore hemodynamics is with pressors, continuously infused intravenous medications which act by either increasing peripheral vascular resistance, increasing inotropy, or both. At this point, there is strong expert consensus that norepinephrine should be the first choice presser in septic shock. If norepi is insufficient, vasopressin, epinephrine, dopamine, dopunamine, and phenylephrine are all potentially reasonable as a second med to add, depending on the circumstances. So in the young person with no evidence of cardiac compromise, phenylephrine, a pure vasoconstrictor, is a sound choice. But in an older person with a history of heart failure, phenylephrine, not a good choice at all, and dopamine or dopunamine might be better. The bottom line is to start norepi for just about everyone, but the choice of second presser is very patient dependent. The next priority after hemodynamics is treating the underlying infection. For this, we want to use broad spectrum antibiotics. How broad and how many antibiotics depends on whether there is a specific infection suspected, whether the patient has risk factors for antibiotic resistance, and how sick they are overall. There is some debate as to how quickly antibiotics should be delivered. Sepsis guidelines state that a patient with sepsis should be, receive antibiotics within one hour, while some infectious disease doctors fear such a recommendation is leading to docs feeling obligated to give antibiotics before even having a proper opportunity to determine the probability the patient is even infected. So they recommend giving antibiotics ASAP or as soon as is prudent, which may in some cases be longer than an hour. In addition to giving antibiotics, you also need to address source control, meaning draining abscesses or DCing a potentially infected indwelling line. If there are multiple options for addressing source control, for example, a percutaneous versus a surgical approach to draining an abscess, there should be greater weight given towards whichever procedure can be safely performed the most quickly. When treating the hypotensive septic patient, what are the signs that a patient has received an adequate amount of fluid resuscitation? The mean arterial pressure is 65 or higher. Urine output is at least 0.5 milliliters per kilogram per hour. The patient's mental status has normalized. Lactate is improving. And for patients who are being mechanically ventilated, there are a number of dynamic measures of hemodynamics, which are typically assessed via ultrasound. There are a few important miscellaneous issues when it comes to treating sepsis. First, if it's felt that multiple antibiotics are required to cover both MRSA and gram-negative organisms, you should avoid the combination of vancomycin and piptazo, better known as zosin. This is due to the increasingly recognized risk of kidney injury, which appears to be relatively high for this specific combo. Alternatives that would provide similar coverage would be vanc plus cefepime or vanc plus a carbapenem. While empiric steroids are not recommended routinely in septic shock, they should be considered when shock is refractory, meaning that the patient remains hypotensive despite receiving an appropriate amount of fluids and being on at least one presser. The optimal choice of glucocorticoid and dose are not known. Some clinicians will also add the mineralocorticoid fludrocortisone, while others feel that this is not necessary. So-called early goal-directed therapy, in which sepsis management is highly protocolized to target very specific hemodynamic goals, which originally shown in 2001 to provide a huge mortality benefit compared to standard care. However, more recent studies have consistently failed to show benefits, likely because standard care has gotten so much better since then. And in the absence of ongoing hemorrhage or active myocardial ischemia, red cell transfusions should only be given once the hemoglobin drops below 7 grams per deciliter.
Although I won't take time to discuss them in depth, there are two interesting additional issues in the management of sepsis, specifically septic shock, which are discussed in the ICU and emergency room from time to time. The first is related to lactic acidosis. You might recall that when I mentioned that serum lactate could potentially help identify systemic hypoperfusion, I included a question mark afterwards. The reason for this is that there is a minority opinion that the elevated lactate seen in septic shock may not be caused by tissue hypoxia and subsequent anaerobic respiration. The alternative hypothesis is that in shock, intrinsic beta agonist activity leads to an increase in the rate of pyruvate production, which then overwhelms the Krebs cycle's ability to process it. Some of the accumulating pyruvate is then shunted into lactate, a process that may be enhanced by thymine deficiency. Thus, lactate is really a marker of the body's intrinsic stress response rather than being a dangerous byproduct of anaerobic metabolism. Like I said, this is a minority view, and I won't offer a personal opinion on it other than to say that the debate about it is really interesting. The other additional issue is vitamin C. In 2016, a small retrospective study was published which found a possible very substantial mortality benefit to treating patients with septic shock with a combination of high-dose intravenous vitamin C, thiamine, and hydrocortisone. The authors put forward about 10 different overlapping mechanisms by which this combination of medications could have led to such benefits, but to date there have been no follow-up randomized controlled trials to confirm this very early preliminary finding. At this time, high-dose vitamin C remains investigative only and should not be routinely used outside of a clinical trial. There are links to more info on lactic acidosis and vitamin C and sepsis in the video description below. Thanks for watching.